Hey, what's up, guys? So this is probably my favorite haul for this year so far. Uh, please excuse me if I have an interruption at the door. Uh, my good pal and amazing Spider-Man aficionado Davis Comic Finds, he found a, a t-shirt that he ordered to have sent to me online that uh, I'm assuming comes from the Big and Tall store because otherwise uh, the only other thing that would fit me would be a car cover for a 1976 Volkswagen Bug. <laughs> so uh, these books were mostly ordered online off of eBay. Uh, I'll just jump right into them. Now this is Pirate Club from November of 2004. Uh, the one San Diego Comic Con that my brother and I ever attended was in the summer of 2004 on a Sunday, so we caught it on the last day when a lot of the creators and artists alley are worn out, um, just ready to pack up and go. They've had their accolades and their flattery <laughs> for the year, and uh, mostly they're, they're not phoning it in at that point because a lot of them are still really cool, but uh, if you have any idea how tired they'd be after that, um, it was it was mostly winding down, but some of the creators were still uh, happy to talk about their books, and one of them was an artist uh, I'd been collecting for a little while. This is uh, Derek Hunter's Pirate Club. Now this is, uh, I'm just gonna call it SLG Publishing. Uh, so this book came out in a time when uh, pirates were kind of what zombies became for, uh, for us for a while there. Uh, Disney's Pirates of the Caribbean had just come out. And I like this book because it had kind of a cool, uh, fat-lined uh, street art style. SLG, uh, they mainly did uh, black and white graphic kind of gothic uh, 90s style books, uh, Squee, uh, Johnny the Homicidal Maniac, and uh, Lenore. They even had the contract to do Disney's Haunted Mansion for a while there. But anyway, this one's pretty cool cover. I used to have one through three, so I didn't pick that one up, but here's a cool issue four. Issue 6 from May of 05. There would be some cool cover on the cover art on the back. There would be a guest artist that would do an image of the characters. This one was cool. Uh, I skipped issue 5. Uh, this is issue 6 with the NES uh, cartridge design. Also from May of 05, uh, this book would come out maybe every couple of months because Derek Hunter was doing everything. That's issue seven. I liked all the the jagged corners he'd put in his inks. Sometimes when they would print the art it would end up looking kind of uh, pixelated. You would see that the lines on the final covers would would be jagged like, uh, like a graphic, um, almost, uh, what do you call them? Pigments, you know, or something to that effect. So it was digitally printed but it usually looked pretty smooth. So sometimes they would come out looking a little jagged. Uh, like, you know, excuse me, not pigments, pixels. That was the technology they were working with, probably the Canon printers. Uh, from November of 05, we have a, a Pirate Club 8.
nice cover. I, I never uh, really saw these before. Uh, from Fe uh, February of 06. Uh, we have Pirate Club 9. That's a cool cover. I'm always a sucker for a, a mainly white background cover with a splash of blood. That's cool on the, uh, the snowflake. Very nice design there. <laughs> Sorry if it seems like I'm trying to do a sort of ASMR. I'm just trying not to uh, um, raise my voice too much because I'm so close to the speaker. <laughs> uh, from May of 2006, Pirate Club 10. Um, this was a wraparound cover. So, as far as I know, this was the last big issue, and I think Derek Hunter went on to like a lot of these, a lot of these artists out of uh, Artist Alley, these little indie um, writer artists. You know, the guys that did all their own stuff, their lettering and everything. They uh, would oftentimes get deals from Cartoon Network or Adult Swim or. Um, whoever was doing the cartoons at that time to do char character design uh, so you know their concept art would end up making them more money developing other people's stuff so uh, this guy kind of let the dream die <laughs> but maybe we'll see him again with all these like kind of Indiegogo, GoFundMe uh, Kickstarters so I got one more book before you hung it up. It was sad. Uh, a couple of years ago I saw a video where Derek Hunter was doing like a bonfire and he was burning original art. And it really made me sad because I, you know, it was a little unhinged and maybe for him it was therapeutic, but to see all that cool artwork that he'd worked on for so many years and had so much enthusiasm when I met him, to just see it go up in flames was kind of sad. Um, if I could find the video, I'll, I'll post a link. Um, I don't know why he did it, but like I said, maybe it was just part of moving on for him. This is Suburban Warfare. Now that's some good ASMR right there, right? <laughs> I know that's not what uh, anyone's here for, but um, Suburban Warfare uh, Part 1, Derek Hunter. I didn't really know this was going to be a mini book, but I thought it was cool. Sort of either his art style changed or he was kind of um, doing a story of his characters a little younger. Um, I dig it though. Now, this one's really like a homemade book, uh, it's not even uh, trimmed, or when you, you know, if you were to fold over eight sheets of paper. And staple a lot of the guys that you know have made fanzines over the years or their own comics they'll know that it doesn't rest flat there's going to be a, a protrusion of certain pages and when it's folded they're going to stick out so that's the really cool thing about this one uh, you know this could have easily been made out of Kinko's FedEx office um, but yeah it's just cool man these little pirate kids they're like these little grammar school kids that uh, just have this club where they pretend to be pirates. <sighs> well, yeah, so Derek kind of was cool. I just, I don't know. <laughs> Artists sometimes, you know, they, they have a real love-hate thing with their, um, with their characters that they've worked on, and who knows. <laughs> anyway, um, I have a couple... Ultraverse kind of Marvel type books. Uh, this is Rune uh, Silver Surfer. This is the standard edition. Um, I guess it's from April of 1995. Um, yeah, uh, Malibu Ultraverse did a pretty big Marvel crossover, and this, as far as I can tell, is the coolest cover of, of those books. Now, uh, this cover is amazing. The coloring's amazing. Barry Windsor Smith 
if uh, if he had done the interiors, this would be a classic book. Uh, did I say what year this is from? Oh, I said April 95, yeah. Uh, this is just an amazing cover. I don't know if I'd ever really seen uh, Barry Jude, Silver Surfer, so, I mean, it's amazing. Uh, Rune and a Silver Surfer. Now, Rune had so many crossovers, I haven't even scratched the surface. Anyway. There's another Ultraverse book from November 1994. Uh, writer Steve Gerber, penciler Mike Plug. Mike Plug, I believe, did a lot of the Animal Man stuff. But Sludge was kind of the Ultraverse. He's not really a Swamp Thing, Man Thing. He's more of a, a, a Sludge Man or a Muck Man from like, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. He's a sewer dweller. Uh, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's a Christmas book. Sludge, Red Xmas. Ultraverse was getting some pretty cool artists. I mean, Mike Plug. I think he did the artwork on uh, Saint of Killers four-parter. Uh, some of my favorite Garth Ennis writing was on that Saint of Killers book. But anyway. There's my one true Marvel book in this haul. Uh... Thor, uh, number 59 from volume 2, or Legacy 561, uh, Rider, Priest, and the cover and all the interiors by Trent Canuga. So, yeah, that's uh, Legacy issue 561 if you want to pick it up. I can't really bring myself to buy Trent's Marvel Knights Ghost Rider. It's just, um, uh, this is from O2. So Trent's style is already really deviating from Creed, but I can still get down with this. But Ghost Rider, his, like, six issues on Ghost Rider, I think they suffer because uh, they paired him with Danny Mickey doing the inks, and Danny Mickey's a really bad... Uh, match for Trent's pencils. Uh, Danny Mickey, like amazing over Capullo, super detail image style. But for Trent's, once again, kind of fat lined 90s style of like imitating Sam Keith, Kevin Eastman, that, um, that Danny Mickey style of super raw pen quill. Uh, needle tip fineness it just doesn't really go uh, so I got two copies of armature number one 1996 Steve Olaf uh, this is a beautiful book um, it's sad that only two issues came out the coloring on this is just amazing and the story's kind of cool too uh, uh, guest starring Sam Keith's The Max I mean so I, I picked up two of those. Really cool character. I mean, I don't know why uh, Oli Optics didn't really continue doing this. I, I guess Steve Olaf was just so busy coloring Spawn. And McFarlane, he held true to his deadlines. Uh, okay, so this is another artist I met at San Diego Comic-Con, uh, I guess day four, 2004. I'll just share these real quick, because we're kind of running in. Uh, Peanut Butter and Jeremy, number one. James Kochaka. Uh, just black and white, kind of uh, squiggly... Uh, ink and brushwork inside, you know, it could easily be something you'd see in the Sunday, or just the weekly funnies, I know the Sundays are always in color, um, 
So here's book two. You really have to open these up to see who's doing or see what issue you're talking about. But yeah, this is uh, Peanut Butter the Cat and Jeremy the Crow and every issue uh, Peanut Butter wears a different hat. <laughs> it's kind of <laughs> sort of what it is. From August of 02, Peanut Butter and Jeremy 3. That's cool, right? He's wearing a bowler this time. <laughs> uh, nest and Window Exchange. Oh, sounds like the Davis Comic Finds uh, t shirts arrived. I'll be right back. Maybe I can share it. <laughs> False alarm. It must have been someone's car, uh, the little locking mechanism, rather than uh, those, those little tracking devices the post office uses. But anyway, uh, from August of 2003, this is for free comic book day, issue four of Peanut Butter and Jeremy. Whereas the other covers are on kind of a, a card stock of paper, this is on more of a you know, glossy stock, so it loses a little bit of its charm, but I, mean, I had to complete the run, and it's probably the only copy I could find that wasn't punched with an LCS's, a local comic book store's uh, uh, moniker, so. All right. Just a little bit more... James Kochaka, this is uh, Monica's story from February of 1999. <laughs> uh, just remember this being spotlighted in uh, Wizard Magazine. Uh, you can really see what I'm talking about with uh, the way the, the artwork if it's run through a digital process, it can kind of come come out looking a little like blocks. Make sure I focus again. Yeah, this is the first print. Um, <laughs> it, it's a book from its time, uh, Alternative Comics. Whew, boy, it was cold out there. Should have checked with the people before just opening the door. Yeah, so it's a it's a cute story. It really adds some charm to uh, Monica Lewinsky's plea, and uh, uh, I, I think I read that Clinton, of all the presidents, you know, uh, after his <laughs> after his run, well. Uh, even if it was cut short. He had the highest approval ratings leaving the office of, of a lot of them, so... Uh, yeah, this is just a nice little spin on the story. Um, the art's really nice, I mean, so innocent. <laughs> even, even when getting down to some of the more uh, grimy details, it, it handles it with a lot of whimsy, so... Uh, now these books mean a lot to me, because... At a time when I really wasn't collecting and actually didn't even have transportation, I was going to a comic book store about two towns over in Stanton, California. I was in Buena Park, California at the time. And I'd take a bus and I'd go to Beach and Ball Comics on a Beach Boulevard in Ball, Row, Ball Road. And I remember there was a Tom's Taco. I'd get an horchata and a uh, crunchy beef taco, and I'd, I'd read the new issue of uh, Tales from the Crypt from Paper Cuts. Uh, um, this was July of 07. Kyle Baker cover. Um, just, I love this book so much. I mean, this really was a brilliant book to me, and it inspired me to kind of do my own. Um, Kind of spooky stories with a narrator, and um, I don't know these 
these books just really whet my appetite. I was so into anthology horror. I was watching Monsters and Tales from the Dark Side and Alfred Hitchcock Presents. Uh, obviously, like the Twilight Zone stuff, but um, I couldn't get enough of it. So these books, um, <laughs> I, I can't even describe like how much I like the mix of the really dark, twisted endings and the kind of lighthearted style of art they were doing. I don't think it really meshed with a lot of people and their sensibilities, but for me, I loved it. Um, <laughs> and uh, this is issue two from September of 07, around 2010 in a yard sale. Oddly enough, uh, I sold all of these. I, I was selling my comics, I had these in a cardboard box for a dollar an issue and my neighbor across the way I just sold him ironically enough uh, a cover to a car cover to a Volkswagen bug <laughs> for 20 bucks and his friend uh, who was going camping with my neighbor that weekend uh, he saw these and he knew I don't know you know he didn't really know what they were he didn't seem like a comic collector but he knew for a dollar a piece, uh, Tells from the Crypt, and he bought them all. And, um, I mean, with the 20 bucks and probably the extra 12 from selling these Tells from the Crypt, I mean, we all went out to ice cream, but <laughs> um, I kind of miss these books a lot. It's a Steve Mannion cover, uh, Tells from the Crypt, number three from. November 2007, another Steve Mannion cover. A murder and idol is not seen on TV. I mean, these are great. <clears throat> I, I recently bought this whole run for 30, and they're, they're you know, they're, they've been read, but mine were, were read too, because I, I mean, I knew how to take care of comics, but. I couldn't get enough of these, so. Uh, from Volume 2, <laughs> they call it Volume 2, number 4, from January of 2008, covered by Chris Noth. I don't know how to pronounce that name. It's a cool story. Um, just a lot, of, a lot of stuff from the early-ish 2000s. You know, YouTube was kind of new. That was a, that story was a spoof on uh, World of Warcraft. A lot of this stuff I didn't know about. Like my main way of tapping into the culture at that time, because I didn't I didn't have the internet yet, was uh, South Park. You know, if I if I saw something on South Park, that would give me some reference. Uh, from March of two thousand eight, issue five. James Romberger cover. This Romberger had a really loose, uh, kind of frantic style. And then you had this uh, artist, Mr. X's, E-X-E-S, and he had two styles he used. One of them was uh, <laughs> really angular, almost like Powerpuff Girls, and then he had a more of a pop art style from uh, May of... 08, number six, another Steve Mannion cover. This one had a, like a, uh, you know, whatever was on TV, American Idol or um, like kind of game show stuff they were doing. Uh, Mannion cover is amazing though. And Rick Parker who was mainly a letterer. He had done like Beavis and Butthead. Uh, he was doing the the ghouls, you know, the Vault Keeper, the Crypt Keeper, and the Witch uh, from September of 2008. Here's number eight. This one had two covers. I'm missing issue seven. It wasn't in the lot, but he did include like, you know, Sarah Palin, Rick Parker spoof. This was a Christian Zinier cover. Same issue, number eight from 2008. That's 
cover B. I'm just going to do a single, just a short zoom. From November 2008, number nine. This is an amazing story. The Chicken Man. I really like this one. That's another Steve Mannion cover. Uh, from January of 2009, uh, number 10, Steve Mannion. This was my first exposure to Mannion. It wasn't until I wanted to get this cover back that I realized who Mannion was because I hunted this book down and I wanted to know who the artist was. So it's number 11 and that is from March of 09 and the seller included uh, two copies of that and wow just tremendous. I just I can't say anything about that cover. It's it's too amazing to put into words. There's only a couple more issues. From May of 2008, this is number 12. Another Mannion cover. These all came out in little digest size like Reader's Digest size trade paperbacks. Uh, number 13 from July of 2009. This was before I knew about Diary of a Wimpy Kid, Diary of a Stinky Dead Kid. All right, the rest of these are trades, so I think we can get through them pretty quick. Well, they're mostly trades. Um, Savage Dragon, the latest trade paperback, collecting 247, 248, 249, 250, 251, and 252. I'd fallen behind, so I read this. Uh, great stuff. Um, it's, very, uh, it's a very sexual book. Uh, his wife, uh, Maxine, and, I mean, she, she's a healthy girl. She, she enjoys her life. <laughs> Quite a bit. I mean, it's it's really cool. Um, Malcolm Dragon has no complaints. Uh, this is issue two fifty four from November twenty twenty. He's a strapping lad, so he's he's up for the challenge. Um, I'm missing two fifty five, but here is two fifty six. January of 2021. I read this, man. This is incredible. Shout out to Big Albo. He's um, the biggest uh, Mako fan I know. He's a good choice for a character. Mako's sick. Here's 257. I haven't read this one. This is the latest issue from February. Uh, shout out to Fred Hall, Direct Edition. Um, excellent, excellent content. Uh, can't recommend it enough, especially, you know, f for those of us going after some action figures. But uh, The Death of Superman, uh, Collected Assorted Edition. This is, you know, they call it a graphic novel from uh, 1993. <laughs> um, I know Fred Hall. And I also know a PGH Zombie, he has a fondness for this Death of Superman, Resurrection of Superman, Funeral for a Friend era. I wasn't collecting comics at that time, but I, I remember Saturday Night Live doing the, the Superman's funeral, or his wake, and Chris Farley was playing the Hulk, giving like the eulogy. Okay. Um... Yeah, <laughs> Terry Hatcher as Lois Lane, uh, Lois and Clark, The New Adventures of Superman. This is just a nice cover on a collection of John Byrne stuff, but um, uh, from 
1994. Uh, yeah. I hadn't seen the, um, their real and their spectacular uh, Seinfeld episode, but I don't know. This theory, yeah, sure. She was, she was a nice Lois Lane. Um, yeah, Riggy was coming into his own. <laughs> and uh, seventh grade, and yeah, Jerry Asher was, was in his thoughts. <laughs> I think she was in, um, what was that? Tango and Cash? What, I think she played Sylvester Stallone's sister in uh, kind of an 80s action buddy comedy, but... Anyway, more Superman. Uh, this is volume four uh, from 2017, collecting 26 through 35. Mark Miller. I needed that for my run. Yeah, and this is just the book. Um, I think uh, Master X Splinter, Master X Splinter at the time shared. I just always wanted this book. And there was a copy on Lone Star. And they were calling it very fine, but this book, it's in great shape. Issue 41, uh, there's 22 stories, most of them a page long. And I just came across another Bruce Tim. Someone listed up Batman Adventures, uh, Dangerous Dames and, De and Demons. So, and probably my favorite purchase uh, the Batman Adventures Mad Love from 94 this is the prestige edition it's got a little condition issue I believe it's called a uh, third print but um yeah anyway um thanks for watching really appreciate it um hope you guys have a great month and uh I might be taking a little time off that was sort of my last hurrah for a while <laughs> I gotta get get back to my general routine but um have a great one and yeah um hope we all have a good spring uh spring forward all right goodbye